Welcome back. This is lecture number three from the series of lecture for post-operative, perioperative acute pain management. <clears throat> In this lecture, we'll cover the non-opioid analgesics. Last lecture we spoke, we give you, uh, give you an overview about uh, opioid. This lecture will be non-opioid, so it will be a lot of information. Let's get started. Now, as a reminder, these are the other lectures, and I recommend you uh, watch them by this order. Okay, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are among the most common used uh, drugs in the world because of their anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and antiviratic effect. The therapeutic benefit of NSAIDs is believed to be mediated through the inhibition of cyclooxygenase enzyme, both type 1 and uh, 2, which convert arachidonic acid to uh, PGH2. Administration of NSAIDs can reduce the dose of opioid required and occurrence of opioid-related side effects. In a meta-analysis of 52 randomized trial of multimodal analgesia with non-opioid analgesic treatment with NSAIDs, reduced opioid consumption, pain intensity, nausea, vomiting, and sedation compared with morphine alone. Unlike opioid, NSAIDs exhibit ceiling effect with respect to maximum analgesics, except one of the opioid, if you can think about it. Okay, so um, it inhibits the cyclooxygenase, which prevent the formation of inflammatory mediators, such as prostaglandin and uh, thromboxan. Two forms of cyclooxygenase, uh, cyclooxygenase, as we see in this uh, diagram, uh, COX-1, is an enzyme produced under physiologic condition and present in all tissue, including gastric mucosa, where it has a protective effect. While COX-2 is an uh, inducible enzyme and is produced primarily at the site of inflammation. COX-2 produces prostaglandin that mediates pain, inflammation, fever, and carcinogenesis. Prostaglandin E2 is the key mediator for both peripheral and central sensitization. Peripheral, peripherally, prostaglandin do not directly mediate pain, rather they contribute to hyperalgesia by sensitizing receptors to other mediators of pain uh, sensations such as histamine and bradykinin. Centrally, prostaglandins enhance pain transmission at the level of dorsal horn by increase the release of, of substance P and glutamate from first order pain neuron, increase the severity of second sorry, increase the sensitivity of second-order pain neuron and inhibiting the release of neurotransmitters from the descending pain modulating pathway. Now, as we know, uh, NSAIDs can be selective, non-selective, semi-selective, based on how much they tend to block uh, COX-2. So, Things that are selective, you have the Celebrex. The other hand, purely non-selective, you have the aspirin. And in between, you have the ipoprofen, naproxen, meloxicam, diclofenac, etc. So, with selective COX-2 uh, inhibitors, you will have less risk uh, of uh, cardiovascular even. Uh, sorry, more risk of cardiovascular event and less risk of GI side effect. Um, the more it gets uh, less selective, 
um, you get more risk of GI side effects. Again, um, it blocks the arachidinic acid, so um, prostaglandins here has multiple effects in airway resistant, um, renal blood, uh, GI, and therefore you would expect to have side effects based on that, including allergy, GI uh, irritation, platelet inhibition, sodium retention and edema, renal toxicity, hepatic toxicity. Therefore, patients with asthma, GI bleeding, coagulation, hypertension, cardiac failure, renal impairment and hepatic impairment, you should be cautious on using NSAIDs. There is a long list of uh, side effect with NSAIDs. Um, these are the most common. You should be familiar with them and you should be indeed familiar with side effect of all medication, any medication you prescribe to the patient and drug interaction, of course. So platelet dysfunction is the big one by inhibiting uh, uh, procoagulant thromboxane. Um, um, NSAID administration in the operating room should be delayed until hemostasis is being achieved. Uh, GI, uh, ulceration and uh, bleeding, uh, effect of NSAIDs on uh, uh, anastomotic leak after colorectal surgery, controversial. Um, this is why you have to go uh, case by case. Um, nephrotoxicity, mainly in uh, non-selective enzymes, uh, it decreased prostaglandin, as we know, that uh, lead to vasoconstriction and decreased kidney blood flow, and that increased the risk of nephrotoxicity, uh, especially if you have patients with hypovolemia, congestive heart failure, and uh, chronic renal insufficiency and elderly. Cardiovascular uh, uh, thrombotic events and increase uh, blood pressure uh, in hypertensive patients. So hypertensive patients, especially uh, on uh, RAS inhibitors, RAS stands for um, renine, uh, renine angiotensin aldosterone system and uh, inhibitors, and this is typically include the AC inhibitor and the angiotensin uh, uh, release blockers, uh, receptor blockers. Both of them belong to the uh, RAS inhibitor. So if, if you're a patient taking RAS inhibitors or beta blockers, so RAS or beta blockers, so be careful on these patients. Um, NSAIDs might uh, cause uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure, so and that's because NSAIDs inhibit uh, the production of renin. So you need to frequently monitor the blood pressure in this patient. Now, um, congestive heart failure, um, especially in patients uh, uh, with a history of congestive heart failure, they can decompensate if they take NSAIDs especially uh, those taking uh, diuretics and in the first few weeks of NSAID. So uh, be careful there. Palpitation also. Musculoskeletal, both uh, COX-1 and 2 play a significant role in bone fusion for the fraction and the use of traditional NSAIDs uh, has been found to inhibit the healing process, particularly following lumbar spine fusion surgery. The effect of COX-2 inhibitor on bone Fusion following orthopedic procedure continue to be controversial. Again, so consider that um, case by case and discuss it with the surgeon. Others, uh, NSAIDs should not be administered to patients who uh, is known to have hypersensitivity to the drug or to patients with um, SAMTERS trial, which is a SPRIN uh, trial, uh, which is a medical condition characterized by aspirin. Uh, Insensitivity, asthma, and nasal polyposis. 
COX-2 selective inhibitor uh, developed to minimize the side effect. Uh, we have a uh, few of them uh, uh, released in the market, and uh, especially here we're talking about the Vioex, um, and get uh, recalled uh, by manufacturer because of concern about uh, adverse cardiovascular side effects. Uh, Celebrex, however, is the only uh, COX-2 specific inhibitor currently available in the United States for acute postoperative pain. The recommended oral loading dose is 400, followed by 200 milligram orally every uh, uh, 12 hours for several days. COX-2 specific inhibitor offer the potential advantage of reduced incidence of gastrointestinal ulceration, and they do not inhibit platelet function. So that's two advantages there, because prostaglandins play a crucial role in uh, renal function through their effect on the blood flow, uh, natureses, and glomerular filtration. Traditional incidence and COX-2 inhibitor can, be, can cause uh, fluid retention and hypertension, as we discussed. So do not recommend prescribing COX-2 inhibitor for patients with known history of coronary artery disease or uh, cerebrovascular disease. Finally, avoid uh, siloxicip and uh, valdicoxib in patients with uh, uh, allergic type of reaction to uh, sulfur. Ipoprofen Ketorolac, Diclofenac are uh, non-selective NSAIDs and available uh, for IV use. Ipoprofen usually uh, 400 to 800 orally or IV. Uh, indeed, uh, the FDA just approved uh, the IV uh, ipoprofen for, for post-operative use, so we will see more studies there and more use. Uh, Ketorolac. Uh, available as IV or IM or oral. The optimal dose of ketorolac for post-operative pain control is 15 to 30 milligram every six to eight hours. Do not exceed five days, five days. Commonly, I think people think five doses, but the recommendation for five days. A standard dose of 50 milligram of ketorolac provides analgesia equivalent to six to 12 milligrams, say 10. Uh, morphine, so see how potent it is, uh, but has uh, a longer duration uh, than morphine and lack the respiratory depressant effect of morphine. So very potent uh, uh, medication. Ketorolac and other NSAIDs inhibit platelet aggregation and prolonged bleeding time, therefore should be used with caution in patient risk of postoperative hemorrhage. Ketorolac was found to reduce postoperative opioid consumption by uh, 25 to 45% and thereby lower opioid related side effects such as ileus nausea and vomiting. Diclofenac, it comes with sodium or potassium, has an excellent energetic properties and is particularly effective for patients with inflammatory components and pain after uh, tooth extraction, for example. It's available in oral and injectable form for IV administration or infusion in adults only. Diclofenac is contraindicated in pregnancy and during lactation. Uh, oral dose, initial start adult at uh, 50 milligram orally three times daily. The total dose per day should not exceed 150 milligram per day. Um, in children over age of 12 and weight is more than 20, the only indication is juvenile chronic arthritis. Uh, and it can be administered as 1 to 3 milligram per kilogram per day, divided in 2 to 3 doses. Uh, adult IM injection, it's a deep intramuscular administration of 75 milligram of uh, diclofenac into upper quarter. Uh, outer quadrant of the gluteal muscle, 150 in case of severe pain. Also very effective uh, here. IV infusion of diclofenac must not be given as an IV bullet. 57.5 uh, milligram IV infusion over 15 seconds every 
six hours as needed for pain. Total dose per day should not exceed 150 milligram again per 24 hour. Infusion should not be administered for more than two days. Okay, here is a um, summary table to some of the uh, common answers uh, that you can go over uh, and it summarizes for you the onset dose, etc. Let's talk about acetaminophen or uh, in some countries they call it paracetamol. Uh, commonly known in the U.S. as Tylenol. Uh, so why acetaminophen? Why, why we like acetaminophen? acetaminophen? Why I think every patient should take acetaminophen? Well, there are uh, plenty of data, very good data from meta-analysis, from trials, showed that uh, uh, it, it has a, a statistically and clinically significant uh, reduction in opioid consumption and improved pain uh, control. So it's effective, it's, it's effective. Uh, it is cheap, uh, high bioavailability, bioavailability, almost 90%. Uh, so this is why it's a, a great oral uh, administration. Uh, safety profile is very good. Acetaminophen is devoid of many of the side effects uh, generally associated with NSAIDs and opioids and etc. Uh, mechanism of action. It's an antipyretic as well as analgesic, like aspirin, but devoid of anti-inflammatory effect. Um, central anti nociceptive effect with minimal peripheral effect. Central cyclooxygenase uh, uh, O2 uh, COX2 inhibitor by reducing um, uh, uh, heme at the peroxidase site of the enzyme and inhibit prostaglandin uh, H2 synthase. So it has both central and uh, peripheral uh, effect, more so uh, central. Maybe modulation of descending inhibitory uh, serotonergic pathway and the drug may act on the opioid cannabinoid transient potential receptor of valoid type 1 and an MDA receptor, all uh, potential uh, mechanism of action here. However, the main one again is the central anti nociceptive effect. It has a ceiling effect. So IV acetaminophen has more rapid and predictable onset of about 5 to 10 minutes and its peak in about 15 minutes. Rectal or oral administration onset about uh, anywhere between 10 to 60 minutes and uh, its peak in about uh, one and a half hour. Uh, the doses, um, IV and oral very similar dose, so uh, patient over 50 kilogram, uh, you can give uh, 650 milligram every four hour uh, or uh, a gram every six hours, not to exceed four gram per day. Um, a reduced dose of acetaminophen should be used for uh, low weight adult and uh, adolescent uh, below 50 kilogram and in patient with mild to moderate hepatic insufficiency, chronic alcoholism, uh, malnutrition, uh, or uh, dehydration. In pediatric, the dose is 15 milligram per kilogram per dose. The oral dose is 325 to one gram uh, every four to six hours, maximum dose again, four gram per day. Uh, rectal dose mainly used in pediatric and it is 40 milligram per kilogram per dose. Uh, in adult, 2 gram of oral acetaminophen is equivalent to 200 milligram of uh, siloxicrib. Uh, metabolism, 90% conjugated with uh, glucuronide. Metabolite is excreted in the bile, uh, 5 to 15% oxidized via the cytochrome P450 to uh, the uh, uh, N-acetyl P450. 
benzo uh, quinone uh, uh, amine uh, that uh, detoxified by uh, glutathione. Then the NAPQI is uh, is a toxic uh, uh, for the liver, as we see. Uh, so liver failure, um, excess acetaminophen ingestion can lead to uh, glutathione consumed, uh, increase in a PQI, lead to uh, liver toxicity. Approximately 10 gram required for toxicity in adult. Alcohol lowers threshold for toxicity and treatment usually with in acetylcysteine as it's a precursor for the uh, glutathione, as we see here. And it increases the glutathione uh, that will decrease the, uh, again, the N-acetyl B benzoquinone uh, amine. And uh, the loading dose of uh, N-acetylcysteine usually 140 milligram per kilogram orally or 150 milligram per kilogram IV. Acetaminophen is almost entirely metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. Uh, should be used cautiously in patients with alcoholism, chronic malnutrition, severe hypovolemia, or severe renal impairment. Acetaminophen is contraindicated in patients with severe hepatic insufficiency or severe progressive liver disease. Patients with severe renal insufficiency, defined by creatinine clearance less than or equal 30 ml per minute, require longer dosing interval, not more often than once every six hours, and a reduced total daily dose of acetaminophen. Okay, let's switch gear now and talk about uh, alpha-2 receptor agonists. The exact mechanism by which alpha-2 agonists, here we're talking about clonidine and dexmedomidine, produce analgesia remain unknown. However, the presynaptic activation of alpha-2 receptor that result in the decreased release of norepinephrine is believed to mediate analgesia. Alpha-2 agonist also reduce the undesirable physiologic and psychological effect of opioid withdrawal. Studies include, studies indicate that uh, alpha-2 agonists such as clonidine and dexmedomidine exert a potent analgesic response and that their potency is increased by concomitant opioid therapy. Clonidine, half-life 9 to 12 hours, may be administered perioperatively to prevent, uh, to provide analgesia, sedation, and anesthesis. Clonidine can be administered orally, transdermally, intravenously, perineurally, and neuroaxially for perioperative pain management, although not routinely used Preoperative oral clonidine, 150 to 200 mic, has been shown to provide preoperative hemodynamic stability and reduce requirement of postoperative opioid analgesia. Premedication with 5 mic per kilogram of oral clonidine in patients undergoing knee surgery can decrease the use of PCA morphine and decrease the incidence of postoperative nausea and vomiting. In addition, the combination of oral clonidine three to five mic per kilogram with 0.2 milligram per day of transdermal uh, uh, clonidine can decrease postoperative PC, PCA morphine uh, requirement by 50% following uh, uh, prostatectomy uh, surgery. In a double-blinded placebo-controlled study, investigators demonstrated that addition of 25 mic of intrathecal clonidine to bubivacaine and morphine, spinal anesthesia, cocktail for uh, TKA could reduce postoperative morphine use and improve uh, pain scores uh, in the first 24 hours. In combination with local anesthetic clonidine in a dose of 0.5 to 1 mic per kilogram may enhance the efficacy and increase the duration of perineural block. Clonidine may also decrease postoperative shivering. Side effects from clonidine include sedation, hypotension, 
bradycardia if dose exceed 150 mic. Dexmetomidine is the other popular alpha-2 receptor agonist. Half-life here is two hours. Uh, it's reported to have a greater affinity for the 2A subunit of the receptor, which may account for the drug's superior analgesic property to clonidine, whereas clonidine is a selective partial agonist for alpha-2 adenoreceptor. Dexmetomidine is a super selective for the receptor. Their uh, respective um, alpha-2 to alpha-1 binding ratio about 220 to 1 for clonidine versus 1620 to 1 for the dexmetomidine. Analgesia is mediated supraspinally, locus uh, uh, colorus, spinally, uh, sub, uh, substantia gelatinosa, and uh, peripherally. Dexmetomidine is a potent high selective alpha 2 adrenoreceptor agonist which demonstrate cardioprotective, neuroprotective, and renoprotective effect against uh, hypoxic ischemic injury. The drug has been described as a useful and safe adjunct in numerous clinical situations, include premedication prior to intubation and extubation, procedure sedation, awake intubation, uh, adjunct to regional analgesia, uh, awake rainies, interoperative and postoperative analgesia as part of multimodal protocol. The drug does not decrease gut motility and prevent postoperative nausea and vomiting and shivering. The most frequent observed adverse effects associated with the use of dexmetomidine are bradycardia and hypotension, especially with high bolus doses, which can be adequately treated with atropine, glycopyrrhate, and ephedrine. This table summarizes the doses for dexmetomidine uh, when you use it as an IV, for example, 0.5 to 1 mic per kilogram over 10 to 20 minutes, followed by maintenance, IM, spinal, epidural, peripheral nerve, buccal, and intranasal. You would be surprised to know that, or maybe, tizanidine which is known as a muscle relaxant, is indeed an alpha-2 receptor agonist. So tizanidine, or Xanaflex, is an alpha-2 receptor and commonly used a uh, uh, muscle uh, relaxant. Uh, it can decrease sympathetically mediated pain, uh, mainly metabolized by the P450 enzyme, mostly secreted in the kidney, Side effect, as expected, will be sedation, weakness, dizziness, nervousness, constipation, diarrhea, and may decrease heart rate and blood pressure as other alpha-2 agonists. Um, initial dose, um, uh, 2 milligram oral, and uh, can be given a PRN no more than three doses of uh, per 24 hour maintenance, titrate in two to four milligram per day, um, and do not exceed uh, 24 milligram uh, per day. Gabapentinoid, let's talk about gabapentinoid. Gabapentinoid includes gabapentin, which is, uh, Neurentin and Brigabalin, which is the Lyrica. These are alpha-2 um, subunit uh, uh, calcium channel uh, ligand uh, blockers indicated for the treatment of partial onset seizure initially and neuropathic pain like post-herpetic neuralgia and other chronic pain state like fibromyalgia. However, there is now a, a growing body of evidence supporting the use of these drugs in the perioperative era. We go over this. Uh, so alpha-2 delta subunit calcium channel are uh, upregulated during nerve injury. 
The anti nociceptive mechanism of action of the gabapentinone has two aspects modulation of the calcium induced uh, release of uh, glutamate centrally in the dorsal horn and activation of the descending noradrenergic pathway in the spinal cord and brain. Likewise, because the gabapentinoid can prevent the establishment of surgery-induced central sensitization, these drugs may play a role in preventing the transition from acute to chronic pain. However, limited and low-quality data available. Uh, studies found decreased incidence of postoperative delirium vomiting pruritus and retention associated with administration of gabapentinoids. Common side effects associated with this drug include sedation, headache, dizziness, and visual disturbances. Respiratory depression has been reported in older patients uh, and in those who receive gabapentin along with other analgesics. The data on gabapentinoid and other respiratory depression and abuse potential are uh, evolving. This caution is also advised when prescribing these drugs to gabapentinoid naive patients as, as this class of medication has abuse potential. The optimal dose and number of doses of gabapentin has not been determined. Higher doses up to 1200 milligram orally as a single dose or more prolonged therapy may be used and may be more effective, but may result in a greater sedation. Pregabalin can be used as an alternative to gabapentin, given as a single preoperative dose, 75 to 50 milligram orally. Now, this is a beta analysis that you must be familiar with. It is recently published in Anesthesiology. It is by far the largest Meta analysis, as you see, and basically uh, this trial has almost 25. This sorry, meta analysis includes almost 25,000 participants um, for uh, patients who get pregabalin or gabapentin initiated any time between one week before or 12 hours after. Surgery. The primary outcome was the intensity of postoperative acute pain. Clinically significant was based on the minimal important difference of 10 points from 100. So, in a scale of 0 to 10, that's equal to 1 over 10. If you look at the result here, um, at 6 hours, just was just 10, which is 1, a scale of uh, 0 to 10. And after that, really, it's below 1, right? So this is clearly uh, not clinically significant. Uh, now, the conclusion was gabapentinoid were not associated with clinically meaningful different postoperative pain intensity. Um, there was no um, uh, significant effect uh, with preventing postoperative uh, chronic pain and etc. So the take home message, or my recommendation at least, that uh, um, the, you should not use gabapentinoid routinely. It's not like Tylenol or NSAIDs that everyone should take it. Um, especially if you have patient, elderly patient, risk of fall, um, other medication that may increase the risk of respiratory depression here or fall, um, I would avoid it. Uh, however, if you have uh, surgery with neuropathic pain, then it might be worth trying gabapentinoid. Um, I think the problem with most of the studies of gabapentinoid in the perioperative pain that you, 
as as we know from the chronic pain field, uh, gabapentin take time to reach a therapeutic level. Um, this is why we usually start the patient in low dose and we increase it so the patient tolerates. Um, so it's hard to believe that taking one dose or two doses will make a big difference. However, if you have a patient and you really think gabapentin will make a difference for them, again, patient with potential neuropathic pain, then you have to start it and be patient, increase the dose, and hopefully once you reach a therapeutic level and it's long enough in the system, you will find uh, benefits. Let's talk about lidocaine, very important. So lidocaine has been shown to be have analgesic, antihyperalgesic, and anti-inflammatory uh, effect. In vitro studies indicate that benefit effect of intravenous lidocaine are mediated by inhibitory action of voltage-gated sodium channel and other, which we'll show you in, in a second. The perioperative infusion of lidocaine has been shown to improve postoperative um, uh, Postoperative analgesia in patient recovering from laparoscopic uh, colectomy, but also decrease postoperative opioid requirement, attenuate postoperative ileus, and accelerate time to discharge from the hospital. So, very important slide, very important slide. Mechanism of action of uh, intravenous lidocaine. You can divide it into three big categories, anti-nociceptive, anti hyperalgesic anti-inflammatory. The anti-nociceptive here mainly by blocking the sodium-gated channel. It blocks other channels and receptors like metcarinic, dopamine, potassium. Uh, it modulates uh, uh, other receptors as you see. Um, Antihyperalgesic mainly by inhibiting the NMDA receptor and anti-inflammatory by inhibiting uh, leukotrienes like uh, uh, B4 leukotrienes. It has a dose-dependent inhibitory effect of the uh, polymorphonuclear granulocyte and uh, mononuclear cell, um, inhibiting release of uh, superoxide anion blocking interleukin, reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines, and etc. Um, inhibit prostaglandin, attenuate vascular inflammation, increase in cellular mediated uh, immunity. So, very complicated, very uh, uh, extensive uh, effect, if you wish. Now, the ideal dose of systemic lidocaine has yet to be clearly defined. However, a bolus dose of 1.5 to 2 mg per kilogram followed by an infusion of 1.5 to 2 mg per kilogram per hour has been recommended for the treatment of perioperative pain. This recommendation results in a serum concentration in therapeutic range, which is 1 to 5. So the therapeutic range anywhere between one to five. Serum concentration greater than five associated with cardiovascular CNS systemic toxicity. So this is a suggested uh, way of doing it. So start at the induction of anesthesia with one milligram per kilogram bolus, then start the infusion, high dose, 40 mic per kilogram per minute, decrease the rate at the end of the surgery, keep it and pack you at one milligram per minute, keep it the same and postoperative day one, you can reduce the dose at that time if you are concerned about any side effect and stop it in day two. Optimal dosing of lidocaine is not known again, but consensus indicates that a loading dose, same thing, one to two milligram per kilogram followed by one to two milligram per kilogram per hour infusion during early postoperative pain control while recovering from anesthesia to achieve therapeutic level here, you know, anywhere between uh, one to five. Improve analgesia, 
in the immediate post-operative period. Initial dose, again, 1.5 milligram per kilogram, 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram, calculated based on the ideal body weight, given infusion followed by infusion of no more than uh, uh, 1.5 milligram per kilogram per hour. Maximum dose is 120 milligram per hour, and uh, this, the, the, the second day you may want to reduce the dose 50%, again, based on your assessment. Uh, IV lidocaine should not be used at the same time as or within the period of action of other local anesthetic intervention. This includes not starting IV lidocaine within four hours after any nerve block and not performing any nerve block within four hours after discontinuation of IV lidocaine infusion. Although there has been a long history of using IV in acute and chronic pain setting, the literature on the benefit effect of perioperative IV lidocaine is inconclusive. There is a meta-analysis from 2018, a relatively big meta-analysis, did not find a clear evidence to support the use of routine IV uh, lidocaine. However, uh, by doing uh, more search, you will find most of the available evidence that supports the use of IV lidocaine, mostly with laparoscopic colon surgery, spine surgery, bariatric surgery, and breast surgery. Um, I was part of uh, a study a few years ago. We did it for the uh, press surgery. Interestingly, we did not find a statistically significant reduction of uh, neither pain score nor opioid consumption in the first uh, few days after surgery. We published that in another paper. Uh, however, we did find a um, reduction in the incidence of chronic uh, post-surgical pain at six months. So uh, there are a few other studies that start to support this uh, concept. Contraindication of lidocaine infusion, sensitivity, uh, significant heart disease, second or third degree block, uh, severe cardiac failure, uh, history of Adam's stroke, uh, Wolf Parkinson syndrome, uh, active arrhythmias, concurrent treatment of class 1 antiarrhythmia or amiodarone, uh, severe hepatic impairment, severe renal impairment, history of uncontrolled seizure, and acute porphyria. So that's the keyword again, uncontrolled seizure. Now, usually uh, lidocaine came uh, in two different bags, either uh, two gram or one gram uh, bag. Um, so when you start it, uh, you have to assess for uh, adverse effect. At a mild, uh, toxicity level, things like numbness, tingling in the fingers and the, around the mouth, um, metallic taste, uh, lightheadedness, dizziness, ringing in the ears. Um, and this is usually uh, when the level uh, below five. As the level build up and go, and you are about 10, then you will see lose of consciousness and uh, muscle twitches, and uh, when it reach 15, patient may de can develop coma, myocardial depression, and at uh, 25, uh, patient can arrest, or 20. This is why you have to be very uh, uh, thoughtful when you assess patient and try to catch them uh, uh, here. Sometimes you will see the patient really develop the symptoms anywhere between uh, one and five. Lidocaine patch. So as we speak of lidocaine, let's cover the lidocaine patch. Uh, mostly available as 4%. It's over the counter. However, it can come as 5%. Uh, 
uh, may apply up to three patch together and the patch should stay for uh, 12 hours. Uh, initially used for post or uh, post herpetic neuralgia, then uh, lower back pain. And this is where we have uh, our pharmacokinetic data. Overall, it has a good safety profile. In the last few years, become more popular for treatment of postoperative pain. Thus, we do not have good evidence about its efficacy yet. So this is a study that was just published, and uh, they uh, looked at the efficacy of lidocaine patch after arthroscopic rotator cuff um, repair. So it's a relatively small study here, uh, provided um, uh, the lidocaine patches, and uh, they follow up uh, the patient uh, up to uh, two weeks. Uh, uh, all patients received interscaling nerve block plus the lidocaine patches, and they found no significant whatsoever with uh, pain at rest, pain at activity, or opioid consumption. Um, indeed, what I found it interesting here that when it comes to patient satisfaction, uh, those with uh, the, the lidocaine patch, they have lower satisfaction, interestingly. This is another study. Uh, um, as you see, a uh, patient after uh, C-section, um, again, a uh, relatively small sample size. Um, they put uh, two patches, as you see here, and um, they look at for pain score up to uh, 36 hours. And they did find uh, a statistically and clinically meaningful uh, difference, if you look here, between the two groups, up to 36 hours. They did not find a difference in the other outcome, which is the opioid consumption and quality of recovery. However, they did find it in uh, pain scores. Here is um, another study, also very recent study, as you see all these new studies. Um, uh, similar uh, uh, C-section, however, this is specifically in obese women, um, and they did not find uh, no, not effective at reducing the average total uh, dose of morphine, did not seem to improve uh, pain score, so another negative study. Uh, here is one more study, again, new study, this is sternotomy, and um, they looked at the pain score up to 24 hours. Uh, again, small study, and uh, they found a statistically and clinically clinically meaningful reduction in both uh, pain scores and opioid. So, as you see, the the literature still small. Uh, some negative studies, some positive studies. Um, However, you can think about uh, my take-home message here that um, be thoughtful about uh, where is the pain and how close this will be to the nerve ending. So sternotomy, this is uh, superficial when you compare it to uh, obesity. Uh, this was positive, but when it comes to obese, it was not positive, and this was not positive because you already have Important region and see the on board. So it's a case by case at the end of the day. Okay, um, finishing up the lidocaine, uh, we should talk about expiral or uh, bubivacaine liposomal uh, expiral uh, may provide prolonged post surgical analgesia for up to 72 hours with a single dose local administration at the surgical site. Uh, FDA approved it as of today only in patient age six years and older for a single dose infiltration to pro, uh, uh, local uh, in adults as an interscaling brachial plexus nerve block to produce post-surgical region analgesia. Any other 
uses outside these two, uh, they are off label. Maximum adult dose, 266 milligram, 60 mil, in pediatric patient age six uh, and less than 17, you can give four milligram per kilogram. Expiral may be administered simultaneously in the same syringe and uh, bubivacaine may be injected immediately before expiral. If ratio of the milligram dose of bubivacaine solution does not exceed one to two. Expiral should not be admixed with local anesthetic other than bubivacaine. Non-bubivacaine-based local anesthetic include lidocaine may cause an immediate release of bubivacaine from expiral if administered together locally. The administration of expiral may follow the administration of lidocaine after delay 20 minutes or more. Side effects like bubivacaine as well as uh, chondrolysis should not be administered intraarticular and uh, methemoglobin. Convulsions and cardiac arrest. Um, convulsion and cardiac arrest has uh, occurred uh, following accidental um, intravascular uh, injection. Avoid additional use of local anesthetic within 96 hours. I know it's different from institute to institute, but this is the manufacturer recommendation. Expiral has not been evaluated for use in the following patient population and therefore is not recommended for administration to this uh, group, patient younger than six years old, patient younger than 18 year old for interskin and plexus, and pregnant patient. Okay, magnesium. In brief, the mechanism of analgesia is thought to be mediated by NMDA receptor antagonism, as well as regulation of calcium influx into cell, resulting in suppression of neuropathic pain and inhibition of central sensitization, potentially making this drug useful in opioid tolerant patients. IV magnesium has been found to be an effective adjuvant for reduction of opioid requirement. It may be useful in opioid tolerant patient or when there are medical concerns related to opioid dose. Two meta analyses evaluate intraoperative IV magnesium sulfate compared with placebo or no treatment over 1,200 patients find that IV magnesium reduce opioid consumption and pain score in the first 24 hour without serious side effect. In one analysis, 24 hour morphine consumption decreased by 24%. Uh, both bullets and continuous infusion regimen were effective. Total perioperative dose range from one to 23.5 uh, gram without correlation between dose and reduction in morphine consumption. The optimal regimen has not been determined yet. Glucocorticoid steroids have analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and anti-emetic effect, effective for prevention of uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting. It works by inhibition of uh, cytosolic uh, phospholipase A2, upstream from the lipooxygenase and COX enzyme in the prostaglandin cascade. Most certainly account for both their anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect by inhibiting leukotriene and prostaglandin production. The recommended preoperative IV dose between 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kilogram because the drug has uh, been reported to cause perineural irritation, be careful there, in 50 to 70% of individual following ground administration. Prudence uh, detect that the drug uh, should be diluted uh, in 50 ml of normal saline and injected over 10 minutes prior to surgery. Again, if you are giving that in awake patient. The benefit effect of 
uh, dexmetomidine for postoperative pain were evaluated in meta-analysis of 24 randomized trials, including approximately 2,700 patients. Dexmetomidine, more than 0.1 milligram per kilogram IV, but not lower doses, reduce postoperative pain and opioid consumption. The benefit of glucocorticoids in the postoperative setting must be balanced with significant potential risk, including impaired healing, hyperglycemia, immunocompromise, among others. Okay, let's talk about ketamine. Ketamine is a non-competitive reversible inhibitor of NMDA receptor, N-methyl-D aspartate receptor and also act at mu opioid receptor, monoaminer monoaminergic receptor, gamma aminobutyric acid receptor, block sodium channel receptor, and others. So it's not only in MDA, but in MDA is the most important. Ketamine has a, a char center and a carbon two atom of cyclohexenone ring, and therefore exist as the optical uh, stereoisomer S and R ketamine. S ketamine has a fourfold greater affinity for NMDA receptor than R ketamine. This difference results in a clinical analgesic potency of S ketamine approximately two times greater than that of racemic and four times greater than that are ketamine. So S ketamine has shorter duration of action on the other hand. R ketamine has been found to have better sustained antidepressant. So R better antidepressant is more uh, potent analgesic. Low-dose IV ketamine has proven to be very effective in management of perioperative uh, pain. Numerous meta-analyses describe uh, the benefit in opioid sparing, uh, pain scores up to 24 hours, 20, uh, 48 hours. Uh, we have uh, a very decent convincing data uh, for ketamine. So, ketamine therapy for perioperative pain management is commonly initiated intraoperatively by starting on a bolus dose, 0.3 to 0.5 mg per kilogram, followed by infusion of 0.1 to 0.5 mg per kilogram per hour. The infusion should be discontinued 60 minutes prior to the end of surgery to prevent prolonged emergence from analgesia. Then you can start it thereafter. The benefit of adding ketamine to PCA with opioid is less established and not recommended, so not, not in the PCA. General ketamine is uh, at sub anesthetic doses is recommended for patients with uh, pain, maybe uh, difficult to manage opioid alone, uh, very uh, uh, painful procedure, uh, opioid dependent, uh, patient with potential uh, respiratory depression, all of these are a great candidate. Um, in 2018, a systemic analysis also showed the benefit. Uh, uh, I found, uh, I did more uh, search here and uh, get you a couple of new uh, uh, meta-analyses just published in the perioperative area. So the first meta-analysis here, they included 12 studies, uh, different uh, type of surgeries, and they found um, significant improvement in resting pain in the first 24 hours, uh, not in the um, uh, 48 hours. Uh, movement pain were not uh, uh, significant. Um, as four to 12 hours after surgery, uh, consumption was less significant uh, and statistically significant, then uh, it's not significant after that. The other meta-analysis uh, 13, uh, um, this is mostly in breast surgery, and uh, found that uh, first six hours, 
24 hours statistically significant, also decreased opioid consumption, uh, improved post-operative uh, uh, depression symptoms, less incidence of post-mastectomy pain uh, uh, syndrome. Uh, ketamine excitatory neurotransmitter stimulation of NMDA receptor is believed to be involved in the development and maintenance of several phenomena, including persistent post-surgical pain, hypersensitivity, wind-up and anodynia, opioid-induced tolerance, and opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Uh, there may also be a role for ketamine in the prevention of treatment of postoperative chronic pain syndrome, as we saw in um, one of the meta-analysis just in the previous slide. The risk of psychomimetic adverse effects such as hallucination may be the cause of clinician reluctance to use ketamine. However, in several trials, uh, patients receive ketamine during genesthesia after benzo pre-medication, they usually uh, did well or do well. Um, this is another NMDA receptor antagonist, dextromethorphan, uh, which has a clinical, uh, limited clinical use. Onset of action, very fast. If you're given IV within 30 minutes, IM three to four minutes, intranasal within 10 minutes, oral within 30 minutes. Peak, IM five to three, intranasal 10 to 15, oral 30, rectal, about 45 minutes. Duration of action, IV, five to 10 minutes, very fast, recovery one to two hours. Uh, IM, 12 to 25 minutes, analgesia 15 to 30 minutes, recovery three to four hours. Intranasal, up to 60 minutes, recovery up to uh, one hour. For prevention of pathologic pain after severe tissue injury, ketamine administration should cover the entire, the entire duration of high intensity noxious and inflammatory stimulation, not simply the initial trauma. Very important concept if you remember the preventive analgesia from my uh, first lecture. NMDA receptor should be blocked during ongoing intraoperative as well as postoperative administration of nociceptor. So if you think this patient needs a ketamine, please start it in the surgery, during the surgery. It's okay to turn it off at the end to walk up the patient, then start it again and pack you, send the patient to the floor with ketamine. Because that's what we need to avoid. Uh, we don't want to have this uh, uncontrolled pain. So it has to be ongoing. This is a table that summarizes uh, the doses, how much you give before incision, during surgery, and after surgery, whether you are using a racemic epinephrine, sorry, racemic ketamine, or S or R isomer. Uh, this is the consensus guideline of use of IV ketamine. Uh, that was published in RAPM in 2018. It's the recommendation from ASRA. And as you will see, there is a, a decent uh, level of evidence recommend perioperative use of ketamine and surgery for moderate to severe postoperative pain, perioperative use in patient opioid uh, uh, tolerance, the dosing range up to 0.35 milligram per kilogram and infusion one milligram per kilogram per hour. And relative contraindication, poorly controlled cardiovascular disease, pregnancy, severe hepatic disease, elevated intracranial pressure. In cirrhosis, you should avoid. And uh, it needs to be, uh, uh, the patient needs to be supervised and uh, the team need to be experienced with managing uh, ketamine. Side effect, this is something you need to be familiar with. Uh, so save this uh, table, take a look at it. Uh, it is very important. Cardiovascular, uh, CNS side effect, hallucination, GI, 
it can reduce appetite, it can cause nausea, it can increase salivation, vomiting, uh, musculoskeletal, it can cause a, a jerky movement, um, ocular, uh, you have the nystagmus, the tunnel vision, respiratory, uh, very benign here, uh, and, and even dermal storage manifestation, um, very rarely anaphylaxis and dependence. Um, this is just one slide here uh, with uh, from a meta-analysis that recently got published in anesthesiology and it included uh, 70 studies and they looked at almost all the medication uh, we have in a perioperative setting and the outcome was uh, prevention of uh, chronic uh, post-surgical pain. So as you see here, there was no supporting evidence whatsoever for glucocorticoid. Uh, question mark for ketamine gabapentin and, and more uh, better uh, uh, evidence for uh, brigabalin, IV, lidocaine, and NSAIDs. I will wrap up quickly with uh, non-pharmacological methods. You need to be familiar with this, don't ignore this. Patient education, very important. It is essential that patients understand the likely etiology of their pain. Very simple reassurance to the patient, setting realistic expectation, very important. It's as simple as when you go and see the patient, say, okay, well, you had a major surgery, this is expected, it's part of the healing, you are doing well, every day will be better. Uh, psychological method, distraction by feedback, uh, call, call to increase the threshold of pain, reduce local swelling and muscle spasm, it's used for a limited period of time after tooth extraction, small surgical procedure like knee, you can use ice in the, in the, in the knee, Minor incision, long-term application, unpleasant may cause trauma. Heat, heat relaxed muscle. So if you have a muscle spasm, you can use uh, heat. Improve joint mobility. It is not used in the treatment of acute post-surgical pain in general. However, you might find some indication there. Abdominal binder, something as simple as an abdominal binder or knee brace help um, reduce the fraction movement around the wound and uh, reduce pain. Acupuncture, there is no much convincing evidence of acupuncture so far in the post-operative setting, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll see more data. Uh, rehabilitation, and uh, that's my uh, extra references for you. And uh, thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe here to watch the other lecture.